As you uh, make your way in and get settled, there, there are two handouts tonight. One that has a map on it. This is your typical uh, uh, in, in your binder one. So everyone gets one of those. And then there's another stapled packet. And uh, this is a giant packet of scriptures that I, uh, we're going to go through tonight uh, quickly. Um, and really, you only need one per family. You're going to want to take home just one of these. I promise you it's not something, uh, it, if, if one of you has it, that, that'll be sufficient. Uh, uh, anywho, so we're going to get started here in just a second. Do we have any logistical questions before we get started? Are you guys remembering to bring your binders back? You're not going to tell on yourself if, if not? Yeah. I'm going to keep that. Good, good. I hear paper wrestling. Are you guys in, enjoying the study through threads? Are you, are you enjoying the material? All right, good. Good. <laughs> it is. It's, it's a lot of work. Uh, I, I'm certainly enjoying uh, going through it and uh, uh, getting this in its final format uh, because it is so helpful. And uh, it's, it's been a blast working with Daniel and circling up each week and... and getting it to that final form. Yeah, absolutely. An another quick reminder, uh, if you miss a week, these are all online. Some people didn't realize that we were starting back up the other side of the, the one week off with uh, um, when, when Chad, you, you know, we had spring break and then, and then Chad did the evangelism training. So if you happen to miss uh, a week, all of these are recorded and they're posted online, okay? Well, let's pray, and then we'll jump into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your goodness to us. Uh, help us as we think about the story of the Exodus and, and the story of salvation and redemption. Help us to think well and write about it um, and to understand uh, the coming of your Son and all that that means in our lives, God. And so help us to see things rightly this evening. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's begin just with a really quick, like two-minute review of where we've been, because we are in week eight now, if you can believe. We've been at this now for eight weeks. And so weeks one and two, if you can remember back that far, we wanted to lay a foundation and look at the first three chapters of Genesis. Because if the goal was to really be able to know how to read our Bibles and to see what God is doing through the whole thread of Scripture and to trace these things through, if we don't understand Genesis 1, 2, and 3 with creation and the fall, uh, we're, we're starting in the wrong spot. So we wanted to start there. And so we spent two weeks doing that. And then we moved into some of these threads. And the first one, we looked at Adam and we traced the thread of Adam from the, from the garden right to the second Adam and looking, looking at Christ. Then we moved into looking at the temple. Where was the first temple? Pop quiz. Eden, I heard it very good. The tabernacle was, was, was one too, that's right. But the first was in the Garden of Eden, very good. And so we trace this, this really important thread of where the presence of God dwelt with his people all the way through scripture. The next week, following that up, if we're looking at the temple, the next week, uh, Gary took us through looking at the thread of the priest, if you remember. Uh, he and Pastor Jason led that week. Then we moved into looking at the feasts and the, the Levitical cult uh, practice there and seeing how all of that pointed to Christ. And then last week, we looked at what thread? Prophet. And we looked at a really important passage of scripture as we dealt with prophet. Uh, who was the Old Testament prophet that we were told to be looking for one who would come like this prophet? Moses, that's right. And he's going to come up again tonight. It just so happens as we move into week eight and we hit the Exodus. The Exodus, that's right. So... Um, 
I mean, I would tell you up front, you cannot understand your Bible, particularly the Old Testament, without understanding the Exodus event, right? The Exodus event is the central salvation moment and story of the entire Old Testament that gets repeated and repeated and repeated, and it becomes the theme and the lens that you are continually supposed to look through, all right? So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to... Uh, we're going to walk through the Exodus narrative and understand its key moments, all right? Um, and then we're going to take a little time, and you're actually going to see that those key moments of Exodus movement, uh, when you look back at the patriarchs, you can see in, in Abraham and Jacob some of those exact same patterns, and then we will see how the Exodus points forward forward, and ultimately, it's going to be pointing forward to salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, okay? So with that, what are the important details that we must know about the Exodus uh, in terms of the Exodus event of Israel going to Egypt? So let's, let's start with, uh, how did Israel get to Egypt Yeah, so right, there was a famine, good grief. There was a famine, and uh, Israel is, is a family, right? Jacob and his family are 12, and um, Joseph is sent ahead. And the, the Joseph story, right, it, it's going to take up the majority of the, the second half of the book of Genesis, right? We get lots of story about how, I'm going to use red because too much blue here, uh, the story about how Israel is exiled out of the land and they go to Egypt, right? Initially, because there is a famine in the land and they will stay in, remember the land is promised to be their land. And as we've already studied with this temple or this Eden idea, Okay, uh, that, that's the picture of this promised land. But due to famine in the land, they are forced out. They go to Egypt and they are fruitful and multiply. It starts out really well. But what happens? The next Pharaoh doesn't know who they are, right? Right? and gets worried because they are so fruitful and multiplying. Now, that, that, those terms, they're being fruitful and multiplying, that should take us back. Remember those initial threads with Adam and dominion, right? God wants us to be fruitful and to multiply. That's part of God's blessing to fill the earth with God's image. Well, well Israel as a people, they're going here and they're doing that in Egypt, okay? And and. They're outside the land, and that Pharaoh sees them and enslaves them, captures them, and then begins to force them into hard labor. And so Pharaoh rises up as an evil taskmaster who has now enslaved God's people. And they're going to be there for 400 years, okay, in this dark, deep depression, and then God is going to send a rescuer, right? Who's that rescuer? Moses. There's going to be one who's called and set aside, right? You are going to rescue my people. I've heard my people's cry. And so he sends Moses. And we've talked a lot about Moses, that Moses, in his entire ministry, he holds this really unique spot as prophet, priest, and king. He, he, there's a lot that goes through Moses that he's going to be a very special, important, Christ-like figure where you see all three of those, prophet, priest, and king. And that Moses will go before Pharaoh and demand to let God's people go. All right, but Pharaoh says, no, not going to happen. Who's Yahweh? Okay, and then we get a series of plagues. And the plagues, there's a cyclical pattern to the plagues, and that is the plague uh, uh, starts out, it, it be quickly becomes miserable, and Pharaoh calls Moses back and says, all right, please stop the plague, uh, and then, okay, uh, I'll let you go, just stop the plague, and Moses prays, and then, and then 
Pharaoh's heart is hardened and uh, he doesn't let them go, all right? And that ultimately builds towards the 10th plague, right? And what's the 10th plague? Right, the Passover, right? The death angel is coming. Now, in here, we've spent an entire time looking at a little more detail about that Passover event and the way that it pictures salvation, right? That death is coming because of God's holiness and judgment is coming. You're supposed to take a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost and it's only when you get inside and the death angel sees the blood that you are saved, right? That God is providing salvation in the midst of judgment that's coming, okay? So they're in land and then uh, immediately after the Passover, um, the people are let go. But is, is that the story, is that all that happens? They're simply let go? Well, no, they, they begin to wander and they actually, God, the, God is leading them and suddenly they are trapped where there is, uh, they are surrounded and only by sea and Pharaoh's army has begun to chase. And then you have the most magnificent salvation event moment of the entire Old Testament, right? And that is what? Right, the parting of the Red Sea. And they will, they will come out and they will walk on, uh, they will walk across on dry land, okay? So they are, so that salvation, that exodus, that parting of the sea, and then Pharaoh is defeated in the sea. Next, they will come out and they will go to Mount Sinai where God is meeting them. Okay. In fact, do you know where the burning bush occurred? Remember, Moses was in the wilderness and God appeared to him in the burning bush. Does anyone know where that was? Say it loud. It's on Mount Sinai. Because Moses said, uh, God says, you got, Moses says, give me a sign that it's really you, God. And God says, okay, you're going to come back here and worship well, well, that's Mount Sinai, right? And, and so they come now to Mount Sinai and Moses goes up and he gets the covenant, okay? And then uh, they are going to continue and uh, in the wilderness wanderings, all of this is on your, your map. You should be able to see this, right? God provides miraculously, all right? The wilderness is full of trials, okay? Uh, but God provides sustaining miracles, through it all. God's provision. God leads them with the cloud and the fire and his presence in the tabernacle that's built there, okay, as they're going to make their way into the promised land, okay? That's the overall Exodus pattern. That important narrative is important for the story. Um, now, that quickly gets repeated as they enter the promised land. So when they enter the promised land, what, what has taken place before they enter? We looked at this last week. There was a transfer of power from Moses to Joshua, right? And we even looked at them as a pair of prophets, right? We saw a lot of repeated patterns uh, and, and things that happened there. But so now Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. And when Joshua leads them into the land, what what is the first thing he has to do? What do they have to cross? The Jordan River, right? And what, what is that supposed to remind us of from Moses' crossing the Red Sea? Even though they're two different bodies of water, the picture that we're supposed to come away with is to see that as they go into the land, there is this picture of God providing God's deliverance, God allowing the Jordan to be parted so that they could walk across on dry ground again and, and be able then to enter the promised land and to, and to take the land. So we see that with Joshua. But, but then when Joshua is ready to go into the land, he first sends who into the land? He sends spies into the land, right? This is a different Different than the time when Moses sent the spies who came back with, with the bad report saying, we can't do this, there are giants in the land. These spies are going into the land and they come back and they're ready to go. But before they come back, who do they meet who gives them 
cover when the people of Jericho are, the army of Jericho is looking for them? Rahab. Right? We, see, we see Rahab, and what does Rahab, what is, what is she promised as a result of giving the spies safety? That, that she and her family will be spared if they are, two things, if number one, they are, they are in what location? Her house, and that that house is identified by what? A scarlet cord, right? That word in Hebrew is the word for hope. Uh, and so Rahab is to hang literally a, a thread or a, a, a rope of hope out of her window as a way to identify her home. And anyone who is in that home will be saved. Now, what is that a reminder of from their time in Egypt? The Passover. So even now we're seeing in this Exodus account these repeated things, even in this story with Joshua and the crossing of the Jordan into the promised land, like Moses coming out of Egypt across the Red Sea. And now just like the people, in order to be spared from the 10th plague, would have to be in the home inside the door that has had the blood of the lamb applied. Now we see Rahab and her family who are in her home with the scarlet cord out the window saved from destruction uh, because of the Lord's provision for them. So all these patterns that we're seeing repeated. Okay, now the patterns are gonna continue. So the main pattern that you need to know and understand is the Exodus, what we've just covered, okay? But uh, Moses writes the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, okay? Gets revelation and understanding from the Lord and writes the story of Israel's history. Now, Moses is going to pick up a lot of details about the patriarchs and things that occurred before even the Exodus event, all right? So if you have been an Israelite and you've just walked through the Exodus and this pattern, okay, you are going to uh, sense some of these other patterns uh, whenever you read, uh, even if it's earlier, about Abraham's journey, okay? The great father Abraham. That is the, the beginning, the founder of faith and the promises to Abraham, okay? So, check out Abraham's story, um, we will begin with Abraham's initial calling. This is not on your chart. You have a whole chart about Abraham, but you can start Abraham and his father, his father's family, actually Taran, in uh, Genesis chapter 11, are in the land of Ur, okay? You need to know that, that land is Babylon, okay? Abraham's father, Terran, takes them on a journey because they are headed to the promised land, okay? They are headed to the land of Canaan, and they go and settle in the land of Herod, okay? Uh, by the way, that is in Aram, Okay? So up here in Haran. Now, Abraham's father, Terran, dies while they're in Haran. And then the Lord comes to uh, Abraham and says, finish the journey to the promised land. Now, why am, why am I telling you all that? Well, because there is this pattern. Maybe you know that there was this one that brought them out of the land of Egypt, but then he died died on the journey, and then they was, the mantle was passed to the next one who finished into the land, okay? Now, Abraham comes, and he enters the land, and he, he, uh, he tours the land. He sojourns around the land. He gets to see it all, but then there's these interesting movements that happen in Abraham's narrative, right? He, he's called to the land, but while he's there, a famine occurs, and he is forced to descend into Egypt. Wait a second. That's a lot like when a famine occurred and Israel descended into Egypt. While Abraham goes to Egypt, Sarah, his wife, is seized by Pharaoh. Now, the way that... Uh, uh, because of the seizing of 
Abraham's wife, Abraham is going to be enriched. Um, but you know the way that uh, Yahweh liberates Sarah out of Pharaoh's uh, captivity because he's taken her as his wife? Look at Genesis 12, 17. It's by plagues. If you've gone through this, the Exodus narrative, and then you read, oh my gosh, this is what happened with Abraham. Okay, so Sarah is captured by Pharaoh and then released by plagues. Listen to the verbiage. Pharaoh calls Abraham to himself and says, go, get out of here, okay? All right, and, and it is through that going out that that Abraham actually receives all the enrichment of the animals. Abraham uh, takes the plunder that Pharaoh, whenever, whenever he says, get out of here, he enriches Abraham in that journey. Then you hear some of this other language later. I am Yahweh who brought you out of Egypt, okay? Um, then there's this climactic moment where Abraham and God cut a covenant. And, and it, maybe you've wondered the, the imagery there because Abraham is in this sleepy days and suddenly there is a, uh, uh, there's a smoky, fiery pot in darkness uh, that entails. What's going on with that scene? Well, it's, it's a picture of the thick cloud and smoke and fire that led um, Israel out of Egypt. Okay, all right, so you can see there um, this repeated pattern. If, if you l know the Exodus story and then you look back at Abraham's journey and you go, wow, there's a lot that happened to the first patriarch that mirrors Israel, but it doesn't stop there. No, we can go on and we, we know that Abraham fathered Isaac Right, Isaac had two sons, twin boys, Esau and Jacob, right? The, pro, the son of promise was Jacob. And so we're gonna see even more patterns. So let's think about Jacob's story for just a moment. After Jacob steals the birthright from Esau, he has to flee. And if you're looking ahead on your, on your notes on page 90, you'll see where he flees. Where does it say that he goes? He leaves the land of his father and he goes to Padan Aram, right? So where does he go? He's tracing back to where Abraham was. That's right, and as he's fleeing Esau. Well, when he gets there, he meets some of Abraham's family. He meets Laban and he falls in love with Rachel and he wants to work seven years for Rachel, but Laban double crosses him and gives him Leah and then he has to work another seven years for Rachel. Um, and so, but initially Laban receives him with this warm welcome, right? But then... He ends up having to work for Laban for 14 years in, in hard labor working for, for his father-in-law. Um, but while he's doing that, he's, he's blessed. God, God blesses him. He's blessed with sons. He's blessed with children. He's blessed with herds and, and flocks uh, to the point that Laban is, is jealous of all that uh, happens as Jacob is, is, is fruitful here and his, his things, he is multiplied. Um, and so Laban decides, I've got to put a stop to this, right? And so he attempts to, to keep Jacob from being so successful and so blessed. Uh, and it doesn't work, but eventually what it does is it leads Jacob to pack up his family and his herds and to leave. And along the way, he meets with the Lord, right, as he is headed back to, to his homeland, right, where he fled to escape Esau. He's, he's headed back, and on the way, he meets the Lord who, who tells him, I am the God of this place. I am the God of Bethel. And he says, I've seen all that Laban has done to you, right? And that um, you are going out from this land and you're going back now to the land of your people. And, and so Laban ends up catching up with him in this, in this story. Um, and they, they have a moment there where, where they f go ahead and make peace with their, their strife, right? But Jacob, it shows, is Basically, he plunders Laban because as Laban is trying to trick Jacob, Jacob's name means trickster, so he's trying to trick Laban, so he ends up leaving with, the, with 
Laban's things, right? He plunders Laban is, the, is what you get as you read the story. You see that. Um, and so Laban follows Jacob. Uh, he catches Jacob. Uh, Laban overtakes Jacob, but God protects Jacob. And because we see in the story that God is the one who is with Jacob all along the way. It has nothing to do with Jacob, right? Jacob is a little bit of a rascal, but God is still working and he is still blessing uh, and protecting Jacob, right? Because this promise, this promise that God had made, this covenant with Abraham is, is running with Jacob. But think about that story for a minute and the things that we know from the Exodus narrative that we've already looked at with Moses, right? Did Israel have to flee a land? They've had, they had to flee a Egypt, right? Did, just like Laban subjected Jacob to hard labor, did the Pharaoh subject Israel to hard labor? Israel was multiplied even in the midst of that, just like Jacob was. Um, Pharaoh wanted to stop Israel from growing, just like Laban did for Jacob, God announced himself to the people of Israel that I am, I am your God. You are my people. Just like God remind, God did that with Jacob there on his way back. Um, so you can see all through there, we don't even have to go through the whole chart, but all of these repeated patterns with, we saw it with Abraham in Israel, now with Jacob and Israel. All right. So we understand the main Exodus event. Now we can, we can look back to both Abraham and Jacob and see really strong repeated patterns, right? In the patriarchs. Remember, through our study, we've noticed the importance of the patriarchs as prophets and the, the importance of their story. It grounds our story. Now I want you to notice that uh, I want you to pull out this packet, this stapled packet, okay? And we're going to quickly go through scriptures. I have way too much for you here, so we're going to hit these at a glance, okay? You can take the packet home. I have highlighted sections. When you take it home, what I want you to notice is the language is always calling your mind to remember the Passover or, or the, uh, the Exodus and what took place in Egypt all of that language calls forth, okay? So, with that said, did you know that Moses told Israel before they ever went into the land that they were going to be, that they were not going to stay in the land that long and that they were going to be exiled again and that they were going to need a new exodus did you know that? Look at these first. I, I've, I've given you three, uh, three sections to look at, okay? Um, look, you, again, you can go back and look later at these. Look at the middle section, Deuteronomy chapter 4. See that middle one right there? Deuteronomy 4, 25 and, and 31, okay? Look at it. It says right there, Moses talking to them, you shall not live long in the land, but you will be utterly destroyed, okay? If you flip on the, on the back, there's this entire movement. It, it begins in Leviticus 26. It gets repeated at the end of Deuteronomy. By the way, Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address. He's talking to the people. He's telling them, okay? And he told them, you're not going to be in the land long, but rather you are going to forsake the covenant. This is before they got into the land. He's going to tell them, you're not going to do it right. You're going to forsake the covenant, and I am going to bring plagues upon the land. And you are going to be forced out. All right, I'm summarizing Deuteronomy 29 there, okay? I'm going to bring plagues upon the land, and you are going to be forced out. But then, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, a new exodus is promised, Look at that, Deuteronomy 30, verse four. I'm gonna bring you back. The Lord, your God, will bring you into the land. This is the second time. Will bring you into the land which your forefathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord, your God, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. 
okay? Before they ever got into the land, Moses told them, you're going to mess the whole thing up. I'm going to bring plagues upon the land. You're going to get exiled again, and I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to give you a circumcised heart before it ever happened, okay? Now, flip the page, because this is going to continue. Hosea, okay, a prophet that is 200 years before they go into exile. In Hosea, they are in the land, okay? They're in the land, things are not going well. What you find is the repeated pattern, the repeated pattern, right? Uh, Israel sins, and then, and then God brings judgment upon them, and then sometimes a rescuer comes and brings them back, and then they're good for a little bit, and then they sin again, and you get this repeated pattern, this repeated pattern, okay? And then Hosea comes as a prophet, okay? And he begins to tell them, look, you are going to go into exile. That's what verse 3 says, Okay? I'm going to strip you naked and expose you on the day, and I'm going to take you out into the wilderness and make the, uh, uh, ma- uh, like desert land. I'm going to take you back to exile. Okay? And then just 11 verses later, there is hope of a restoration. This becomes a really important language that gets repeated in the New Testament, Okay? Um, and, and the return, the promise there in verse 15, I underlined it in red, as in the day that you came up from the land of Egypt. And then you have all these promises that, God, I'm going to be a husband to you, and you're, and, uh, you're no longer going to call me master. You're going to call me husband, and I will make a covenant with you, and we will lie down in safety together, and I'm going to have compassion on you, okay? Um, and, and catch this. Look at verse 23. I want to read verse 23 for you. So, one, he's, he's talking about a covenant, but remember, they're already in the land. They're already under a covenant. Why is he talking about making a new covenant with them? Look at verse 23, and I will sow her for myself in the land. Okay, you're going to come back to the land, and I will have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Now, I gave you the reference. You can go home and look this up. Do you know that that unfolds in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, about those of us who've received mercy? We were once not a people, but now we are a people. Those who had not received mercy, now we have received mercy. Guys, that was promised 200 years before the exile in Hosea. Okay, and you can continue on. Let's flip to, uh, let's flip to Isaiah, okay? If you really want to learn a lot about the, the new exodus that's coming, it's all through the book of Isaiah. He writes about it extensively. Remember, this is 700 years before Christ, and it's 100 years before the exile, okay? Okay, so this New exile. They're in the land, but they're going to be exiled. Okay, look at it. it. States it right there. You're going to go into exile. I'm going to remove you far away. But every time he says, though, it's immediately followed by hope. Okay, that's the pattern I want you to see. And as that hope is talked about, you guys know it, all the time we, we read uh, at Christmas time, uh, Isaiah chapter 9. But I want you to know and understand the context of Isaiah chapter 9 is in context of a new exodus. You guys understand what I mean by a new exodus? You're going to go into exile, and then I'm going to bring you back, this new exodus language. So listen to this, Isaiah chapter 9. After it's just talked about going into exile, we read this at Christmas time, but there will be no more gloom for her, Right? Uh, For her who is in anguish in earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali with contempt, but later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Why does that ring for us? Why does that strike in our ears? Oh, because we, what, what happened about Galilee of the Gentiles? Who came out of this land? 
Jesus, right? Right? That's why we read this section. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who are in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. The language here is that those who are in a dark land, because you've gone to exile, I'm going to bring you back. You, you've been dispersed, but I'm going to bring you back. Look at the language, verse 4, right? And and you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Why? Because they're in exile. Okay, you understand that language? They're in Egypt. They have an evil taskmaster over them. There's a new exodus coming. And then there's this introduction to a new king that's coming. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given. And the government will rest upon his shoulders. The name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and on the throne of David. And then we see just a couple chapters later, there's this continued connection, right? Out of the the stem of Jesse, right? A shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of fear. You guys see that in 11.2? What does that sound like to you? Well, we, as New Testament Christians, we know that uh, this is Jesus, right? The Spirit's on him. But we've been walking through this Old Testament category. What are you supposed to see when you see the Spirit resting on someone like this? And he has such good judgment. He's able to judge, and he's able to discern, and he has a fear of the Lord, and he has wisdom and knowledge and counsel, and the Spirit of the Lord's upon him. Who is this one like? Oh, this is, no, 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 this is the one that's like Moses, the promised Moses, the one who knows God face to face. We need another prophet like that. He's coming as part of the new exodus. That's why I'm going through all of this. I'm showing you all these passages, right, that we read at Christmas, and we don't quite understand their context, but we know they clearly point to Jesus. They're in the context, a lot of them, in the language of a new exodus is coming. It's been promised you're going to get into the land, you're going to be exiled, but you will return to the land. You need a new exodus, okay? And there are promises of a covenant that are attached to that. Now, Daniel's going to take over and talk to us about the fact that, well, Israel was exiled. We know that happened, right? Who exiled them? You can say it a little louder. Right, they get exiled to Babylon, and they take this journey, and they're going to be there 70 years, and then they're going to return. And I guess that return was the exodus that we were all waiting for, right? Right. So in, in their minds, think about that with the captivity, right? When the northern kingdom is taken away into captivity, then the southern kingdom is taken away into captivity. They are remembering the prophets of the Old Testament who had warned them that they would be, right? Just like Moses, we saw that, that he had warned them. And so, but then they're, they're hearing this language that God is going to deliver them. He's going to restore them. Uh, we see that in, in Isaiah. If you were to go on into Isaiah 60, uh, 61, 62, in those chapters of Isaiah, there's this incredible language about what it's going to look like when God restores the land. And so, and so there's this, this hope for them. They're, they're looking for this, this deliverance out of captivity to return back to the land, and they get to go back to the land. Um, you remember the, um, Nehemiah going back to the land? Right when, when the king allows him to go back, why does Nehemiah go back? To rebuild the wall, right? Because the wall around the city of Jerusalem is, has been just destroyed. Um, and, and, and when Nehemiah hears about the condition of the holy city of Jerusalem, it says he weeps. But before Nehemiah in Ezra, we read about the temple being rebuilt. When Nebuchadnezzar came and and took Jerusalem, he destroyed the first temple, Solomon's temple. And so now you have a guy by the name of Zerubbabel who rebuilds the temple. Look in Ezra. You don't have this in any of your notes, but in Ezra chapter 3, verse 12, 
This is the temple is being rebuilt. And listen to this. It says, yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of father's households, the old men who had seen the first temple, they wept with a loud voice when the foundations of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy and the sounds of weeping. For the people shouted with a loud voice and the sound was heard from far away. So you have this, this, this tension that exists. There's celebration that they've come out of captivity and they're back in the land. But those who remember what it was like before under, under Solomon, right? They, they remember the, the, the temple uh, that Solomon built and the, the glory of that place. They weep because the glory of the current, the new temple didn't even compare to what they had had. So even though they've come out of captivity, this, this return is nothing like what the prophets have promised. You know, they would be looking like, you promised like we would be a light. We would be this, this place that would bring life and healing and rivers would flow, these streams of life. And the God's presence would be here with us and power and the nations would look to us again and they're looking around like, that's not this. What we are experiencing is not what the, what the prophets had promised would happen on the other side of our captivity, which led them to continue looking for the one that we talked about last week. Remember in Deuteronomy, right? In, 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 chapter, in chapter 18 and then again in chapter 34, where it says that there has not been one like Moses, but there is one who is coming who will come like Moses, and that is the one they are to look for. So even after they've come back, they are still looking, they are still waiting for this prophet who will come, who will really restore to them what they had lost. Does this make sense? You guys trekking? There's the exodus, but as they enter the land, they are told you're going to need a new exodus, and they're exiled, and when they come back, everything is anticlimactic. In Ezekiel, the Spirit of God <coughs> left the temple. Did he ever come back into the new temple? No. When they returned, coming back, was there ever one like Moses? No. No. And then you open up to Matthew's gospel. Uh, church history records that Matthew recorded his gospel in Hebrew, in the Hebrew dialect. And all theologians know that Matthew has this incredibly focused genre towards the Hebrews because Matthew wants you to know and understand that Jesus is the long-awaited one like Moses. How do we know that? Well, look at our chart right here, okay? Page 91. Page 91, right? Because at Jesus' birth, there are all of these events that are so uh, important as Matthew narrates them, and they open your mind, and you say, wait a second, slaughtering babies being forced to go down to Egypt because, there's, uh, because Joseph uh, gets a dream. Joseph, son of Jacob, gets a dream to go down to Egypt because Herod's slaughtering babies in order to protect. Who does that sound like? Oh my gosh, of course, it sounds like Moses, right? Now, what happens? Uh, Jesus is as a baby, is called down. You have this quick little event where he goes to Egypt and come back. Then as you're following along in uh, Matthew's gospel, do you know what the very next scene is? It's the baptism. John, who is Elijah, crying in the wilderness. By the way, all of that's promised in Isaiah 40. Okay? And there's Jesus' baptism scene. What happens next? Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days and is tempted in the wilderness. 
He has three temptations. They're categorical temptations. Every time Jesus responds out of the same section in Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8, all of which how Israel failed, but Jesus succeeds. Okay, okay. Jesus goes to Egypt. The baby imagery reminds you of Moses. The very next scene is the baptism scene. And then Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness being tempted, and he's victorious. And then what happens next? He goes up on a mountain. No? And gives teaching, what we call Matthew 5, 6, and 7, also known as the Sermon on the Mount. And repeatedly in that sermon, he says, you've heard that it's been said, but I say to you, you've heard. And what he does in that text, at times he explains the law of Moses, he has direct intention and application, I have come to fulfill the law of Moses. At times he presses with a new authority that says, look, don't have adultery, I'm telling you this. And he teaches. He comes out of the Sermon on the Mount, Okay, you see the movement. He comes out of the Sermon on the Mount, and that is followed by 10 mighty works and miracles of Jesus in Matthew 8 and 9. And when you read those, what's incredible is Matthew, uh, uh, Jesus comes down from the Sermon on the Mount. This is uh, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew comes, or Jesus comes down from the Sermon on the Mount, and you know the first person that he encounters is a leper. Someone who has a skin disease. In the Mosaic law, what must you not do with someone who has a skin disease? Touch them. You know what Jesus does? Touches them and heals them and says, you now go present yourself to the priest and do exactly what the law of Moses says because they need to see this as a testimony. You know what happens next? There is a centurion who is a Gentile who has a... A, a servant that is paralyzed. This is that encounter where Jesus, uh, where the guy says, hey, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house, but why don't you just, you just say the word and he'll be healed? And, I, and Jesus is blown away. He's like, I've, I've never seen such faith. Then, then you, you know what it says next? It says to a Gentile, after Jesus has just said, I've, I've never seen such faith. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from the east and from the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in the outer darkness. Listen to that language, because if you've just combed through the New Exodus language, right, after you are going to be exiled, I'm going to gather you from the east and the west, from the far ends of the earth, from the darkness. I'm going to gather you together. Jesus has now just said that to a Gentile, said, I haven't seen such faith, but guess what? You're going to be sitting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Come in from the ends of the earth. And the the Jewish people would have heard that and they would have immediately, they would have known Exodus chapter six where, where, where God makes these I will statements about what he is going to do. And one of those statements that they would have remembered at every single Passover that they celebrated because they would drink four different cups during the Passover meal. And one of those was the cup of gathering. And so when they would remember that statement where, where, where God says, I will gather you, right? Jesus takes that statement and, and expands it beyond anything, right? And that's what Matthew is, is, is pointing a finger at to say, look at the kingdom of, of God and what, what he is doing in Christ. 
that Israel, it was just, it was just a foreshadow. It was, it was just pointing to something. Do you, do you think Matthew's trying to be intentional about what he's saying to us? He's screaming with poetic imagery and, and intentionality that where Israel has failed, right? They went into the wilderness and they wandered for 40 years because they failed temptation after temptation after temptation. Jesus has come and he is the new Israel. He's the true Israel. He's the one who does it right. He is the long-awaited promised Moses that you should see, okay? All of this is done. These are not random stories that are told to you. God has been moving for thousands of years years with intentionality in repeated patterns because he knew his son was coming and he wanted you to recognize it when he came because he is the long-awaited prophet, the one like Moses. And his salvation is the new exodus. It is the new exodus, salvation through Christ Christians have long understood this pattern about uh, how our spiritual journey and salvation parallels all of this past imagery, even from the Exodus. How does it sound like for a Christian in this pattern? We would say, I was once enslaved to my sin, right? And I was under an evil overlord that had me simultaneously enslaved to my sin. But God sent a rescuer who saved me and brought me out. But did you go straight to heaven? No, you didn't. Where'd you go? Oh, you're in the wilderness, right? You're waiting heaven, aren't you? What is heaven? It's the promised land, okay? It's not scripture filled with this idea of you're not home yet. There's still trials and temptations and trouble that tackles you, but you're not home yet. You long, you await for a heavenly home. Do not our hymns even sing about crossing over Jordan? What do we mean by when I cross over Jordan? Ah, we're talking about going home, going into the promised land, the return to Eden, the return to Israel, the return to the promised land. This entire movement is captivating of what our spiritual journey is now because there, we are under the new exodus. Makes passages like Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, uh, take on even more meaning, right? Where, where Paul says uh, that our citizenship is in heaven from which we also, we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It, it's, it's that reminder that, that we're not home, but even Paul is borrowing from, from that picture of, of Israel waiting to enter the promised land, just like now we as followers of Christ, are waiting our home, our forever home with him, the one who came to deliver us. And while we're in the wilderness, what do we need to sustain us? Yeah, right, we, we need, we need, we need the, the manna, the light, the presence of the Lord. And Jesus comes along and says what? I'm the bread of heaven, okay? I am the light of the world. You see how all of these things are converging now? You, you remember how the festivals of Passover and Tabernacle, they remind you of this wilderness journey. And then Jesus shows up and says, those things pointed to me. I'm here. I'm 
the bread of life, I am the light of the world. Those things pointed to me. All of this is tied together because it's a continual story, these threads, and as they converge, that is that we are the new exodus. Salvation is the new exodus. And even, even water. We didn't even talk about living water. Yeah. But we could go all the way back in the Old Testament, and we ran out of time last week to even cover this. But if you look at the significance of wells in the Old Testament, right, the things that happened to Abraham at the well, Isaac met his bride at the well, Jacob met Laban and eventually his bride at the well, Moses met his wife at the well. So you have all these different prophets who are at wells and these significant things happening in their lives. And then when Jesus is by a well in in John chapter four, with the woman of Samaria, what does he present himself as there? He says, I offer you living water, right? Another thing that was provided for them in the wilderness, right, that God provided. Now Jesus says, I am the true water that you need to sustain you. So just another one that we didn't even get to last week, but that comes up again uh, tonight that I think is just, it's so incredible to see, uh, like you said it, how God doesn't want us to miss what he's doing. Yeah, because as all of this is, is woven together, as these patterns are repeated, They're all still real, meaningful events in their own context. But once you see the fulfillment and you're able to look back, you know what you realize? There is only one author to the Bible. There is only one author to actually all of history. King Jesus, like it is all pointing to him. And that God is so magnificently preserved and prophesied and and showed these patterns of the coming of his son so that when he's there, you see it and you know this is the son of God because no one can operate over thousands of years and weave through all of this, through so many different authors and so many different circumstances and show you repeated pattern after repeated pattern. They're not random stories. They're threads that are weaving towards the new exodus. Amen? Isaiah 53, we are coming to the righteous sufferer. That that gets its own section, okay? Its own section on the righteous sufferer. Excellent. Two weeks. (laughs) Two weeks away. All right, what do we do? How do we apply what we've talked about? All right, we've got 10 minutes left. How do we apply what we've talked about to our lives? Give me the so what. Well, we know God's word is true. All right. What does this do to your faith about God's word? Tell me. Does it give you some confidence, guys? Right? The Old Testament is intentional, it's pointing to Jesus. All of these stories and these details are written in a way that could only be done by God, okay? And when you see it, it's magnificent. So it gives us such confidence in God's word. What else? Yes, ma'am. Can't hear you, sorry. Okay, it gives us hope, all right? We're, we're right here. Why does it give us hope? All right, well, well one, it gives, it gives us confidence and assurance, right, that, that we're gonna go through trials, there's gonna be temptation, we're gonna have all that, but what? But we've got Jesus, right? 
We've received the final promises. We have the one who has himself gone through trials and temptation, but he's victorious. The chains have been broken. We don't have to be like Israel, okay? We have one who forgives our sin whenever we fall short, but the great news also is we have a victorious one who is the new Exodus, Right? We're not going into the land hearing, by the way, you're going to screw the whole thing up and we're just going to need another one. We've got the one. They longed for our day because we're filled with the Spirit of God. They long for what we have. And yes, we are exiled. And yes, we still long for our heavenly home, but we're not defeated in that way. The New Testament is over, is that you are overwhelmingly a conqueror. We can walk out in newness and victory of life. Now, you're not going to do that perfectly. So we have one who sympathizes and forgives us. But it doesn't mean we have to be just knuckleheads and completely defeated. So there's a lot of hope in understanding the story, right? We understand the story, right? Well, it's a very efficient way to live because we know what to choose and what to spend our time with. Yeah. And so it's a very efficient way to live. You can, if you focus on that, everything else is under brush. Ray makes it Ray makes a great point, right? And that is when you when you find yourself in the story and you know where you are and you know what is awaiting, it brings a clarity, right? How much treasure do you think Israel should have stored up in the wilderness. Probably only stuff they can take with them, right? Would it have made them any good to build a giant castle out there in the middle of that wilderness? No, it doesn't make any sense in the story, right? It, it, the storyline focuses you on where we are and where we're going, and that's our hope. You must have a storyline to focus and to understand. And this, this is that storyline. I'd like to say that we're living in a, under a new covenant. Yeah. And so many times I try to go back to the old covenant. And I should always have hope to go forward under the new covenant. Amen. Amen. If you couldn't hear him, he said, we're under the new covenant, not the old covenant. And our flesh wants to go back to the old covenant. The old covenant's a covenant of works, trying to prove your own righteousness before a holy God, okay? But I hope you understood in that little snippet I gave you of, of Jesus being the new Moses, how it's blowing up the old covenant, okay? Because it's fulfilled. Hear me clearly, it is fulfilled filled through Christ. You must understand it in those lenses. I'm going to give a whole excursus in a couple weeks uh, as we go through the book of Acts on how the Old Testament transfers over into the New Testament, okay? With that said, the new Moses is here, and there is a new covenant that rules and reigns, and that is the one that we are under. It must be seen through that lens. Yes, Paul? Amen. How can we have peace given this story and this clarity? He's not out of control. He's redemptive and purposes. God is in control. Amen. Not only in our lives, but in all of human history. And so when you can look back and you can see the hand of God, you can see the intentionality of God, you can see that kings rose up and kingdoms rose up and all of it looked so scary, but God was moving and God was writing the story. It gives you such a confidence, doesn't it? And you have an unshakable kingdom, Robert. <laughs> cannot be shaken. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, Daniel, close us out in prayer. All right. God, we pause tonight. God, as we just sit and we marvel at your word, uh, God, that you have given it to us. Uh, the psalmist tells us that it is a light 
uh, for us. It is a lamp to our feet. It is a light to our path. And uh, God, by it, we can see clearly because your word reveals to us who you are. It reveals your character. It reveals your heart. It reveals your plan. And it shows that they are unstoppable. So God, may tonight uh, we leave here with the confidence uh, to walk out as, as people who have victory, not in our own strength, but in, in what you have accomplished, Lord Jesus, for us that you have credited to us. And so God, may we live as people with hope. God, may our understanding of your redemption story cause us to live with such a joy that the world takes notice of the hope that is within us uh, and they long for what it is that we have. So God, would you use this uh, to uh, make us an ambassador for you uh, that lifts up the name of Jesus in, in everything that we do. We thank you so much. Uh, we give you praise tonight. You are the only one worthy of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.